beautiful joe by marshall saunders chapter nine the parrot bella i often used to hear the morrises speak about vessels that ran between fairport and a place called the west indies carrying cargoes of lumber and fish and bringing home molasses spices fruit and other things on one of these vessels called the mary jane was a cabin boy who was a friend of the morris boys and often brought them presents one day after i had been with the morrises for some months this boy arrived at the house with a bunch of green bananas in one hand and a parrot in the other the boys were delighted with the parrot and called their mother to see what a pretty bird she was mrs morris seemed very touched by the boy's thoughtfulness and bringing a present such a long distance to her boys and thanked him warmly the cabin boy became very shy and all he could say was go away over and over again in a very awkward manner mrs morris smiled and left him with the boys i think that she thought he would be more comfortable with them jack put me up on the table to take a look at the parrot the boy held her by a string tied around one of her legs she was a gray parrot with a few red feathers in her tail and she had bright eyes and a very knowing air the boy said he had been careful to buy a young one that could not speak for he knew the morris boys would not want one chattering foreign gibberish nor yet one that would swear he had kept her in his bunk in the ship and had spent all his leisure time in teaching her to talk then he looked at her anxiously and said show off now can't ye i didn't know what he meant by all this until afterward i had never heard of such a thing as birds talking i stood on the table staring hard at her and she stared hard at me i was just thinking that i would not like to have her sharp little beak fastened in my skin when i heard someone say beautiful joe the voice seemed to come from the room but i knew all the voices there and this was one i had never heard before so i thought i must be mistaken and it was someone in the hall i struggled to get away from jack to run and see who it was but he held me fast and laughed with all his might i looked at the other boys and they were laughing too presently i heard it again beautiful joe beautiful joe the sound was close by and yet it did not come from the cabin boy for he was all doubled up laughing his face as red as a beet it's the parrot joe cried ned look at her you baby i did look at her and with her head on one side and the sauciest air in the world she was saying beautiful joe beautiful joe i had never heard a bird talk before and i felt so sheepish that i tried to get down and hide myself under the table then she began to laugh at me ha 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 good dog sickum boy rat rats beautiful joe beautiful joe she cried rattling off the words as fast as she could i never felt so queer before in my life and the boys were just roaring with delight at my puzzled face then the parrot began calling for jim where's jim where's good old jim poor old dog give him a bone the boys brought jim in the parlor and when he heard her funny little cracked voice calling him he nearly went crazy jimmy jimmy james augustus she said which was jim's long name he made a dash out of the room and the boys screamed so that mr morris came down from his study 
to see what the noise meant. As soon as the parrot saw him, she would not utter another word. The boys told him, though, what she had been saying, and he seemed much amused to think that the cabin boy should have remembered so many sayings his boys made use of and taught them to the parrot. Clever Polly, he said kindly. Good Polly. The cabin boy looked at him shyly, and Jack, who was a very sharp boy, said quickly, Is not that what you call her, Henry? No, said the boy. I call her Belle, short for Beelzebub. I beg your pardon, said Jack very politely. Belle, short for Beelzebub, repeated the boy. You see, I thought you'd like a name from the Bible, being a minister's sons. I hadn't my Bible with me on this cruise, saving your presence, and I couldn't think of any girls' names out of it but Eve or Queen of Sheba, and they didn't seem very fit. So I asked me mates, and he says for his part, he guessed Beelzebub was a pretty girl's name as any, so I govered that. Twould have been better to let you name her, but you see, twouldn't have been handy not to call her something where I was teaching her every day. Jack turned away and walked to the window, his face a deep scarlet. I heard him mutter, Beelzebub, Prince of Devils, so I suppose the cabin boy had given his bird a bad name. Mr. Morris looked kindly at the cabin boy. Do you ever call the parrot by her whole name? No, sir, he replied. I always give her Belle, but she calls herself Bella. Bella, repeated Mr. Morris, that's a very pretty name. If you keep her, boys, I think you had better stick to that. Yes, father, they all said. And then Mr. Morris started to go back to his study. On the door sill, he paused to ask the cabin boy when his ship sailed. Finding that it was to be in a few days, he took out his pocketbook and wrote something in it. The next day, he asked Jack to go to town with him and when they came home, Jack said that his father had bought an oilskin coat for Henry Smith and a handsome Bible in which they were all to write their names. After Mr. Morris left the room, the door opened and Miss Laura came in. She knew nothing about the parrot and was very much surprised to see it. Seating herself at the table, she held out her hands to it. She was so fond of pets of all kinds that she never thought of being afraid of them. At the same time, she never laid her hand suddenly on any animal. She held out her fingers and talked gently, so that if it wished to come to her, it could. She looked at the parrot as if she loved it, and the queer little thing walked right up and nestled its head against the lace in the front of her dress. Pretty lady, she said in a cracked whisper. Give Bella a kiss. The boys were so pleased with this and set up such a shout that their mother came into the room and said they had better take the parrot out to the stable. Bella seemed to enjoy the fun. Come on, boys, she screamed as Henry Smith lifted her on his finger. Ha, ha, ha. Come on, let's have some fun. Where's the guinea pig? Where's Davy the rat? Where's Pussy? Pussy, Pussy, come here. Pussy, Pussy, dear pretty puss. Her voice was shrill and distinct and very like the voice of an old woman who came out to the house for rags and bones. I followed her out to the stable and stayed there until she noticed me and screamed out, Ha, Joe, beautiful Joe, where's your tail? Who cut your ears off? I don't think it was kind in the cabin boy to teach her this, and I think she knew it teased me, for she said it over and over again and laughed and chuckled with delight. I left her and did not see her till the next day when the boys had got a fine large cage for her. The place for her cage was by one of the hall windows. 
but everybody in the house got so fond of her that she was moved about from one room to another. She hated her cage and used to put her head close to the bars and plead, Let Bella out! Bella will be good girl! Bella won't run away! After a time, the Morrises did let her out, and she kept her word and never tried to get away. Jack put a little handle on her cage door so that she could open and shut it herself, and it was very amusing to hear her say in the morning, Clear the track, children! Bella's going to take a walk! And see her turn the handle with her claw and come out into the room. She was a very clever bird and I have never seen any creature but a human being that could reason as she did. She was so petted and talked to that she got to know a great many words, and on one occasion she saved the Morrises from being robbed. It was in the winter time. The family was having tea in the dining room at the back of the house, and Billy and I were lying in the hall watching what was going on. There was no one in the front of the house. The hall lamp was lighted and the hall door closed, but not locked. Some sneak thieves who had been doing a great deal of mischief in Fairport crept up the steps and into the house and, opening the door of the hall closet, laid their hands on the boys' winter overcoats. They thought no one saw them, but they were mistaken. Bella had been having a nap upstairs and had not come down when the tea bell rang. Now she was hopping down on her way to the dining room and hearing the slight noise below, stopped and looked through the railing. Any pet creature that lives in a nice family hates a dirty, shabby person. Bella knew that those beggar boys had no business in that closet. Bad boy! She screamed angrily. Get out! Get out! Here, Joe, Joe, beautiful Joe! Come quick! Billy, Billy, rat! Hey, out! Jim, sick em boy! Where's the police? Call the police! Billy and I sprang up and pushed open the door leading to the front hall. The thieves, in a terrible fright, were just rushing down the front steps. One of them got away but the other one fell, and I caught him by the coat, till Mr. Morris ran and put his hand on his shoulder. He was a young fella, about Jack's age, but not one half so manly, and he was sniffling and scolding about that pesky parrot. Mr. Morris made him come back into the house and had a talk with him. He found out that he was a poor, ignorant lad, half starved by a drunken father. He and his brother stole clothes and sent them to his sister in Boston, who sold them and returned part of the money. Mr. Morris asked him if he would not like to get his living in an honest way, and he said he had tried to, but no one would employ him. Mr. Morris told him to go home and take leave of his father and get his brother and bring him to Washington Street the next day. He told him plainly that if he did not, he would send the policeman after him. The boy begged Mr. Morris not to do that, and early the next morning he appeared with his brother. Mrs. Morris gave them a good breakfast and fitted them out with clothes, and they were sent off in the train to one of her brothers, who was a kind farmer in the country and who had been telegraphed to that these boys were coming and wished to be provided with situations where they would have a chance to make honest men of themselves. Chapter 10 Billy's Training Continued When Billy was five months old, he had his first walk in the street. Miss Laura knew that he had been well trained, so she did not hesitate to take him into the town. She was not the kind of young lady to go into the street with a dog that would not behave himself, and she was never willing to attract attention to herself by calling out orders to any of her pets. As soon as we got down the front steps, she said quietly to Billy, To Hill. 
It was very hard for little, playful Billy to keep close to her when he saw so many new and wonderful things about him. He had gotten acquainted with everything in the house and garden, but this outside world was full of things he wanted to look at and smell of, and he was fairly crazy to play with some of the pretty dogs he saw running about, but he did just as he was told. Soon we came to a shop, and Miss Laura went in to buy some ribbons. She said to me, Stay out! But Billy she took in with her. I watched them through the glass door and saw her go to a counter and sit down. Billy stood behind her till she said, Lie down. Then he curled himself at her feet. He lay quietly even when she left him and went to another counter. But he eyed her very anxiously till she came back and said, Up to him. Then he sprang up and followed her out to the street. She stood in the shop door and looked lovingly down on us as we fawned on her. Good dog, she said softly. You shall have a present. We went behind her again and she took us to a shop where we both lay beside the counter. When we heard her ask the clerk for solid rubber balls, we could scarcely keep still. We both knew what ball meant. Taking the parcel in her hand, she came out into the street. She did not do any more shopping, but turned her face toward the sea. She was going to give us a nice walk along the beach, although it was a dark, disagreeable, cloudy day, when most young ladies would have stayed in the house. The Morris children never minded the weather, even in the pouring rain. The boys would put on rubber boots and coats and go out and play. Miss Laura walked along, the high wind blowing her cloak and dress about, and when we got past the houses, she had a little run with us. We jumped and frisked and barked till we were tired, and then we walked quietly along. A little distance ahead of us were some boys throwing sticks in the water for two Newfoundland dogs. Suddenly, a quarrel sprang up between the dogs. They were both powerful creatures and barely matched as regarded size. It was terrible to hear their fierce growling and to see the way in which they tore at each other's throats. I looked at Miss Laura. If she had said a word, I would have run in and helped the dog that was getting the worst of it, but she told me to keep back and ran on herself. The boys were throwing water on the dogs and pulling their tails and hurling stones at them, but they could not separate them. Their heads seemed to be locked together, and they went back and forth over the stones, the boys crowding round them, shouting and beating and kicking at them. Stand back, boys, said Miss Laura. I'll stop them. She pulled a little parcel from her purse, bent over the dogs, scattered a powder on their noses, and the next instant the dogs were yards apart, nearly sneezing their head off. I say, Mrs., what'd you do? What's that stuff? Woo, it's pepper, the boys exclaimed. Miss Laura sat down on a flat rock and looked at them with a very pale face. Oh, boys, she said, why did you make these dogs fight? It's so cruel. They were playing happily till you set them on each other. Just see how they have torn their handsome coats and how the blood is dripping from them. Tain't my fault, said one of the lads sullenly. Jim Jones there said his dog could lick my dog, and I said he couldn't, and he couldn't either. Yes, he could, cried the other boy, and if you say he couldn't, I'll smash your head. The two boys began sidling up to each other with clenched fists, and the third boy, who had a mischievous face, seized the paper that had the pepper in it, and running up to them shook it in their faces. There was enough left to put all thoughts of fighting out of their heads. 
they began to cough and choke and splutter and finally found themselves beside the dogs where the four of them had a lively time the other boys yelled with delight pointing their fingers at them a sneezing concert thank you gentlemen encore encore miss laura laughed too she could not help it and even billy and i curled up our lips after a while they sobered down and then finding that the boys hadn't a handkerchief between them miss laura took her own soft one and dipping it in a spring of fresh water nearby wiped the red eyes of the sneezers their ill humor had gone and when she turned to leave them and said coaxingly you won't make these dogs fight any more will you they said no sirree bob miss laura went slowly home and ever afterward when she met any of those boys they called her miss pepper when we got home we found willie curled up by the window in the hall reading a book he was too fond of reading and his mother often told him to put away his book and run about with the other boys this afternoon miss laura laid her hand on his shoulder and said i was going to give the dogs a little game of ball but i'm rather tired gammon and spinach he replied shaking off her hand you're always tired she sat down in a hall chair and looked at him then she began to tell him about the dog fight he was much interested and the book slipped to the floor when she finished he said you're a daisy every day go now and rest yourself then snatching the balls from her he called us and ran down to the basement but he was not quick enough though to escape her arm she caught him to her and kissed him repeatedly he was the baby and the pet of the family and he loved her dearly though he spoke impatiently to her oftener than either of the other boys we had a grand game with willie miss laura had trained us to do all kinds of things with the balls jumping for them playing hide and seek and catching them billy could do more things than i could one thing he did which i thought was very clever he played ball by himself he was so crazy about ball play that he never could get enough of it miss laura played all she could with him but she had to help her mother with the sewing and the housework and do her lessons with her father for she was only seventeen years old and had not left off studying so billy would take the ball and go off by himself sometimes he rolled it over the floor and sometimes he threw it in the air and pushed it through the staircase railings to the hall below he always listened till he heard it drop then he ran down and brought it back and pushed it through again he did this till he was tired and then he brought the ball and laid it at miss laura's feet we both had been taught a number of tricks we could sneeze and cough and be dead dogs and say our prayers and stand on our heads and mount a ladder and say the alphabet this was the hardest of all and it took miss laura a long time to teach us we never began till a book was laid before us then we stared at it and miss laura said begin joe and billy say a for a we gave a little squeal b was louder c was louder still we barked for some letters and growled for others we always turned a somersault for s when we got to z we gave the book a push and had a frolic around the room when any one came in and miss laura had us show off any of our tricks the remark always was what clever dogs they are not like other dogs that was a mistake billy and i were not any brighter than many a miserable cur that skulked about the streets of fairport it was kindness and patience that did it all when i was with jenkins he thought i was a very stupid dog 
he would have laughed at the idea of any one teaching me anything but i was only sullen and obstinate because i was kicked about so much if he had been kind to me i would have done anything for him i loved to wait on miss laura and mrs morris and they taught both billy and me to make ourselves useful about the house mrs morris didn't like going up and down the three long staircases and sometimes we just raced up and down waiting on her how often i have heard her go into the hall and say please send me down a clean duster laura joe you go get it i would run gaily up the steps and then would come billy's turn billy i forgot my keys go get them after a time we began to know the names of different articles and where they were kept and could get them ourselves. On sweeping days, we worked very hard and enjoyed the fun. If Mrs. Morris was too far away to call Mary for what she wanted, she wrote the name on a piece of paper and told us to take it to her. Billy always took the letters from the postman and carried the morning paper up to Mr. Morris's study and I always put away the clean clothes. After they were mended, Mrs. Morris folded each article and gave it to me, mentioning the name of the owner so that I could lay it on his bed. There was no need for her to tell me the names. I knew by the smell. All human beings have a strong smell to a dog, even though they mayn't notice it themselves. Mrs. Morris never knew how she bothered me, by giving away Miss Laura's clothes to poor people. Once I followed her track all through the town, and at last found it was only a pair of her boots on a ragged child in the gutter. I must say a word about Billy's tail before I close this chapter. It is the custom to cut off the ends of fox terrier's tails, but leave their ears untouched. Billy came to Miss Laura so young that his tail had not been cut off and she would not have it done. One day, Mr. Robinson came in to see him, and he said, You have made a fine-looking dog of him, but his appearance is ruined by the length of his tail. Mr. Robinson, said Mrs. Morris, patting little Billy who lay on her lap, Don't you think this little dog has a beautifully proportioned body? Yes, I do, said the gentleman. His points are all correct save that one but she said if our creator made that beautiful little body don't you think he is wise enough to know what length of tail would be in proportion to it mr robinson would not answer her he only laughed and said that he thought she and miss laura were both cranks chapter eleven goldfish and canaries the morris boys were all different jack was bright and clever ned was a wag willie was a bookworm and carl was a born trader he was always exchanging toys and books with his schoolmate and they never got the better of him in a bargain he said that when he grew up he was going to be a merchant and he had already begun to carry on a trade in canaries and goldfish. He was very fond of what he called his yellow pets, yet he never kept a pair of birds or goldfish if he had a good offer for them. He slept alone in a large sunny room at the top of the house. By his own request, it was barely furnished, and there he raised his canaries and kept his goldfish. He was not fond of having visitors come to his room because, he said, they frightened the canaries. After Mrs. Morris made his bed in the morning, the door was closed, and no one was supposed to go in till he came from school. Once, Billy and I followed him upstairs without his knowing it, but as soon as he saw us, he sent us down in a great hurry. One day, bella walked into his room to inspect the canaries she was quite a spoiled bird by this time and i heard carl telling the family afterward that it was as good as a play to see miss bella strutting in with her breath stuck out 
and her little conceited air, and hear her say shrilly, Good morning, Bert. Good morning. How do you do, Carl? Glad to see you, boy. Well, I'm not glad to see you, he said decidedly, and don't you ever come up here again. You frighten my canaries to death, and he sent her flying downstairs. How cross she was. She came shrieking to Miss Laura. Bella loves birds. Bella wouldn't hurt birds. Carl's a bad boy. Miss Laura petted and soothed her, telling her to go find Davy, and he would play with her. Bella and the rat were great friends. It was very funny to see them going about the house together. From the very first, she had liked him and coaxed him into her cage, where he soon became quite at home, so much so that he always slept there. About nine o'clock every evening, if he was not with her, she went all over the house crying, Davy, Davy, time to go to bed. Come sleep in Bella's cage. He was very fond of the nice sweet cakes she got to eat, but she never could get him to eat coffee grounds, the food she liked best. Miss Laura spoke to Carl about Bella and told him he had hurt her feelings, so he petted her a little to make up for it. Then his mother told him that she thought he was making a mistake in keeping his canaries so much to themselves. They had become so timid that when she went into the room, they were uneasy till she left it. She told him that petted birds or animals are sociable and like company, unless they are kept by themselves when they become shy. She advised him to let the other boys go into the room and occasionally to bring some of his pretty singers downstairs where all the family could enjoy seeing and hearing them and where they would get used to other people besides himself. Carl looked thoughtful, and his mother went on to say that there was no one in the house, not even the cat, that would harm his birds. He might even charge admission for a day or two, said Jack gravely, and introduce us to them and make a little money. Carl was rather annoyed at this, but his mother calmed him by showing him a letter she had just gotten from one of her brothers, asking her to let one of her boys spend his Christmas holidays in the country with him. I want you to go, Carl, she said. He was very much pleased, but looked sober when he thought of his pets. Laura and I will take care of them, said his mother, and start the new management of them. Very well, said Carl. I will go then. I've got no young ones now, so you will not find them much trouble. I thought it was a great deal of trouble to take care of them. The first morning after Carl left, Billy and Bella and Davy and I followed Miss Laura upstairs. She made us sit in a row by the door, lest we should startle the canaries. She had a great many things to do. First, the canaries had their bath. They had to get them at the same time every morning. Miss Laura filled the white dishes with water and put them in the cages, and then came and sat on a stool by the door. Bella and Billy and Davy climbed into her lap, and I stood close by her. It was so funny to watch those canaries. They put their heads on one side and looked first at their little bath and then at us. They knew we were strangers. Finally, as we were all very quiet, they got into the water, and what a good time they had, fluttering their wings and splashing and cleaning themselves so nicely. Then they got up on their perches and sat in the sun, shaking themselves and picking at their feathers. Miss Laura cleaned each cage and gave each bird some mixed rape and canary seed. I heard Carl tell her before he left, not to give them much hemp seed, for that was too fattening. He was very careful about their food. During the summer, I had often seen him take up nice green things to them. Celery, chickweed, tender cabbage, peaches, apples, pears, bananas. And now, at Christmas time, he had green stuff growing in pots on the window ledge. 
Besides that, he gave them crumbs of coarse bread, crackers, lumps of sugar, cuttlefish to peck at, and a number of other things. Miss Laura did everything just as he told her, but I think she talked to the birds more than he did. She was very particular about their drinking water and washed out the little glass cups that held it most carefully. After the canaries were clean and comfortable, Miss Laura sat their cages in the sun and turned to the goldfish. They were in large glass globes on the window seat. She took a long-handled tin cup and dipped out the fish from one into a basin of water. Then she washed the globe thoroughly and put the fish back and scattered wafers of fish food on the top. The fish came up and snapped at it and acted as if they were glad to get it. She did each globe, and then her work was over for one morning. She went away for a while, but every few hours through the day, she ran up to Carl's room to see how the fish and canaries were getting on. If the room was too chilly, she turned on more heat, but she didn't keep it too warm, for that would make the birds tender. After a time, the canaries got to know her and hopped gaily around their cages, and chirped and sang whenever they saw her coming. Then she began to take some of them downstairs, and let them out of their cages for an hour or two every day. They were very happy little creatures, and chased each other about the room, and flew on Miss Laura's head, and pecked saucily at her face as she sat sewing and watching them. They were not at all afraid of me, nor of Billy and it was quite a sight to see them hopping up to Bella. She looked so large beside them. One little bird became ill while Carl was away, and Miss Laura had to give it a great deal of attention. She gave it plenty of hemp seed to make it fat, and very often the yolk of a hard-boiled egg, and kept a nail in its drinking water, and gave it a few drops of alcohol in its bath every morning to keep it from taking cold. The moment the bird finished taking its bath, Miss Laura took the dish from the cage, for the alcohol made the water poisonous. Then Berman came on it, and she had to write Carl and ask him what to do. He told her to hang a muslin bag full of sulfur over the swing, so that the bird would dust it down on her feathers. That cured the little thing, and when Carl came home, he found it quite well again. One day, just after he got back, Mrs. Montague drove up to the house with a canary cage carefully done up in a shawl. She said that a bad-tempered housemaid, in cleaning the cage that morning, had gotten angry with the bird and struck it, breaking its leg. She was very much annoyed with the girl for her cruelty and had dismissed her, and now she wanted Carl to take the bird and nurse it as she knew nothing about canaries. Carl had just come in from school. He threw down his books, took the shawl from the cage, and looked in. The poor little canary was sitting in a corner. Its eyes were half shut, one leg hung loose, and it was making faint chirps of distress. Carl was very much interested in it. He got Miss Montague to help him, and together they split matches, tore up strips of muslin, and bandaged the broken leg. He put the little bird back in the cage, and it seemed more comfortable. I think he will do now, he said to Miss Montague, but hadn't you better leave him with me for a few days? She gladly agreed to this and went away, after telling him that the bird's name was Dick. The next morning at the breakfast table, I heard Carl telling his mother, that as soon as he woke up, he sprang out of bed to see how his canary was. During the night, poor foolish Dick had picked off the splints from his leg, and now it was as bad as ever. I shall have to perform a surgical operation, he said. I did not know what he meant, so I watched him when, after breakfast, he brought the bird down to his mother's room. She held it while he took a pair of sharp scissors and cut its leg right off a little way above the broken place. Then he put some Vaseline on the tiny stump, bound it up, and left Dick in his mother's care. 
all the morning she sat sewing she watched him to see that he did not pick the bandage away when carl came home dick was so much better that he had managed to fly up on his perch and was eating seed quite gaily poor dick said carl leg and a stump dick imitated him with a few little chirps a leg and a stump why he is saying it too exclaimed carl and burst out laughing dick seemed cheerful enough but it was very pitiful to see him dragging his poor little stump around the cage and resting it against the perch to keep him from falling when mrs montague came the next day she could not bear to look at him oh dear she exclaimed i cannot take that disfigured bird home i could not help thinking how different she was from miss laura who loved any creature all the more for having some blemish about it what shall i do said miss montague i miss my little bird so much i shall have to get a new one carl will you sell me one i will give you one mrs montague said the boy eagerly i would like to do so mrs morris looked pleased to hear carl say this she used to fear sometimes that in his love for making money he would become selfish mrs montague was very kind to the morris family and carl seemed quite pleased to do her a favor he took her up to his room and let her choose the bird she liked best she took a handsome yellow one called berry he was a good singer and a great favorite of carl's the boy put him in the cage wrapped it up well for it was a cold snowy day and carried it out to mrs montague's sleigh she gave him a pleasant smile and drove away and carl ran up the steps into the house it's all right mother he said giving mrs morris a hearty boyish kiss as she stood waiting for him i don't mind letting her have it but you expected to sell that one didn't you she asked mrs smith said maybe she'd take it when she came home from boston but i dare say she'd change her mind and get one there how much were you going to ask for him well I wouldn't sell Barry for less than ten dollars, or rather, I wouldn't have sold him. And he ran out to the stable. Mrs. Morris sat on the hall chair, patting me as I rubbed against her, in a rather absent-minded way. Then she got up and went into her husband's study and told him what Carl had done. Mr. Morris seemed very pleased to hear about it. But when his wife asked him to do something to make up the loss to the boy, he said, I'd rather not do that. To encourage a child to do a kind action and then to reward him for it is not always a sound principle to go upon. But Carl did not go without his reward. That evening, Mrs. Montague's coachman brought a note to the house addressed to Mr. Carl Morris. He read it aloud to the family. My dear Carl, I am charmed with my little bird, and he has whispered to me one of the secrets of your room. You want fifteen dollars very much to buy something for it. I'm sure you won't be offended with an old friend for supplying you the means to get this something. Adam Montague Just the thing for my stationary tank for the goldfish, exclaimed Carl. I've wanted it for a long time. It isn't good to keep them in globes, but how in the world did she find out? I've never told anyone. Mrs. Morris smiled and said, Barry must have told her, as she took the money from Carl and put it away for him. Mrs. Montague got to be very fond of her new pet. She took care of him herself, and I have heard her tell Mrs. Morris the most wonderful stories about him stories so wonderful that i should say they were not true if i did not know how intelligent dumb creatures get to be under this kind of treatment she only kept him in his cage at night and when she began looking for him at bedtime to put him there he always hid himself she would search a short time and then sit down and he always came out of his hiding place chirping in a saucy way to make her look at him she said he seemed to take delight in teasing her once when he was in the drawing-room with her 
she was called away to speak to someone at the telephone when she came back she found that one of her servants had come into the room and left the door open leading to a veranda the trees outside were full of yellow birds and she was in despair thinking that barry had flown out with them she looked out but could not see him then lest he had not left the room she got a chair and carried it about standing on it to examine the wall and see if barry was hidden among the pictures and bric-a-brac but there was no berry there she at last sank down exhausted on a sofa she heard a wicked little peep and looking up saw berry sitting on one of the rounds of the chair that she had been carrying about to look for him he had been there all the time she was so glad to see him that she never thought of scolding him he was never allowed to fly about the dining room during meals and the table maid drove him out before she set the table. It always annoyed him, and he perched on the staircase, watching the door through the railings. If it was left open for an instant, he flew in. One evening, before tea, he did this. There was a chocolate cake on the sideboard, and he liked the look of it so much that he began to peck at it. Mrs. Montague happened to come in and drove him back to the hall. While she was having tea that evening with her husband and little boy, Barry flew into the room again. Mrs. Montague told Charlie to send him out, but her husband said, Wait, he's looking for something. He was on the sideboard, peering into every dish and trying to look under the covers. He is after the chocolate cake, exclaimed Mrs. Montague. Here, Charlie, put this on the staircase for him. She cut off a little scrap, and when Charlie took it to the hall, Barry flew after him and ate it up. As for poor little lame Dick, Carl never sold him, and he became a family pet. His cage hung in the parlor, and from morning till night his cheerful voice was heard, chirping and singing, as if he had not a trouble in the world. They took great care of him. He was never allowed to be too hot or too cold. Everybody gave him a cheerful word in passing his cage, and if his singing was too loud, they gave him a little mirror to look at himself in. He loved this mirror and often stood before it for an hour at a time. Chapter 12 Malta the Cat The first time I had a good look at the Morris cat, I thought she was the queerest-looking animal I had ever seen. She was dark gray, just the color of a mouse. Her eyes were a yellowish-green, and for the first few days I was at the Morrises, they looked very unkindly at me. Then she got over her dislike, and we became very good friends. She was a beautiful cat, and so gentle and affectionate that the whole family loved her. She was three years old, and she had come to Fairport in a vessel with some sailors who had gotten her in a faraway place. Her name was Malta, and she was called a Maltese cat. I have seen a great many cats, but I never saw one as kind as Malta. What? She had some little kittens, and they all died. It almost broke her heart. She cried and cried about the house till it made one feel so sad to hear her. Then she ran away to the woods. She came back with a little squirrel in her mouth, and putting it in her basket, she nursed it like a mother till it grew old enough to run away from her. She was a very knowing cat and always came when she was called. Miss Laura used to wear a little silver whistle that she blew when she wanted any of her pets. It was a shrill whistle, and we could hear it a long way from home. I have seen her standing at the back door whistling for Malta, and the pretty creature's head would appear somewhere, always high up, for she was a great climber, and she would come running along the top of the fence, saying, Meow, meow, in a funny short way. Miss Laura would pet her or give her something to eat or walk around the garden carrying her on her shoulder. 
Malta was a most affectionate cat, and if Miss Laura would not let her lick her face, she licked her hair with her little rough tongue. Often Malta lay by the fire, licking my coat or little Billy's, to show her affection for us. Mary, the cook, was very fond of cats and used to keep Malta in the kitchen as much as she could, but nothing would make her stay down there if there was any music going on upstairs. The Morris pets were all fond of music. As soon as Miss Laura sat down to the piano to sing or play, we came from all parts of the house. Malta cried to get upstairs, Davy scampered through the hall, and Bella hurried after him. If I was outdoors, I ran in the house, and Jim got on a box and looked through the window. Davy's place was on Miss Laura's shoulder, his pink nose run in the curls at the back of her neck. I sat under the piano beside Malta and Bella, and we never stirred till the music was over. Then we went quietly away. Malta was a beautiful cat, there was no doubt about it. While I was with Jenkins, I thought cats were vermin, like rats, and I chased them every chance I got. Mrs. Jenkins had a cat, a gaunt, long-legged yellow creature that ran whenever we looked at it. Malta had been so kindly treated that she never ran from anyone except from strange dogs. She knew they would be likely to hurt her if they came upon her suddenly. She faced them, and she was a pretty good fighter when she was put to it. I once saw her having a brush with a big mastiff that lived a few blocks from us, and giving him a good fright, which just served him right. I was shut up in the parlor. Someone had closed the door, and I could not get out. I was watching Malta from the window as she daintily picked her way across the muddy street. She was such a soft, pretty, amiable-looking cat. She didn't look that way, though, when the mastiff rushed out of the alleyway at her. She sprang back and glared at him like a little, fierce tiger. Her tail was enormous. Her eyes were like balls of fire, and she was spitting and snarling as if to say, If you touch me, I'll tear you to pieces. The dog, big as he was, did not dare attack her. He walked around and around like a great clumsy elephant, and she turned her small body as he turned his and kept up a dreadful hissing and spitting. Suddenly, I saw a spit dog hurrying down the street. He was going to help the mastiff, and Malta would be badly hurt. I had barked, and no one had come to let me out so I sprang through the window. Just then, there was a change. Malta had seen the second dog, and she knew she must get rid of the mastiff. With an agile bound, she sprang on his back, dug her sharp claws in till he put his tail between his legs and ran up the street, howling with pain. She rode a little way, then sprang off and ran up the lane to the stable. I was very angry and wanted to fight something, so I pitched into the Spitz dog. He was a snarly, cross-grained creature, no friend to Jim and me, and he would have been only too glad of a chance to help kill Malta. I gave him one of the worst beatings he had ever had. I don't suppose it was quite right for me to do it, for Miss Laura says dogs should never fight. But he had worried Malta before, and he had no business to do it. She belonged to our family. Jim and I never worried his cat. I had been longing to give him a shaking for some time, and now I felt for his throat through his thick hair and dragged him all around the street. Then I let him go, and he was a civil dog ever afterward. Malta was very grateful and licked the little place where the spits had bit me. I did not get scolded for the broken window. Mary had seen me from the kitchen window and told Mrs. Morris that I had gone to help Malta. 
Malta was a very wise cat. She knew quite well that she must not harm the parrot or the canary, and she never tried to catch them, even though she was left alone in the room with them. I have seen her lying in the sun, blinking sleepily, and listening with great pleasure to Dick's singing. Miss Laura even taught her not to hunt the birds outside. For a long time, she had tried to get it into Malta's head that it was a cruel thing to catch the little sparrows that came about the door, and just after I came, she succeeded in doing so. Malta was so fond of Miss Laura that whenever she caught a bird, she came and laid it at her feet. Miss Laura always picked up the little dead creature, pitied it and stroked it, and scolded Malta till she crept into a corner. Then Miss Laura put the bird on the limb of a tree, and Malta watched her attentively from her corner. One day, Miss Laura stood at the window looking out into the garden. Malta was lying on the platform, staring at the sparrows that were picking up crumbs from the ground. She trembled and half rose every few minutes as if to go after them. Then she lay down again. She was trying very hard not to creep on them. Presently, a neighbor's cat came stealing along the fence, keeping one eye on Malta and the other on the sparrows. Malta was so angry. She sprang up and chased her away and then came back to the platform where she lay down again and waited for the sparrows to come back. For a long time she stayed there and never once tried to catch them. Miss Laura was so pleased. She went to the door and said softly, Come here, Malta. The cat put up her tail and meowing gently came into the house. Miss Laura took her up in her arms and going down to the kitchen, asked Mary to give her a saucer of her very sweetest milk for the best cat in the United States of America. Malta got great praise for this, and I never knew of her catching a bird afterward. She was well fed in the house, and had no need to hurt such harmless creatures. She was very fond of her home, and never went far away, as Jim and I did. Once, when Willie was going to spend a few weeks with a little friend who lived fifty miles from Fairport, he took it into his head that Malta should go with him. His mother told him that cats did not like to go away from home, but he said he would be good to her, and begged so hard to take her that at last his mother consented. He had been a few days in this place, when he wrote home to say that Malta had run away. She had seemed very unhappy, and though he had kept her with him all the time, she acted as if she wanted to get away. When the letter was read to Mr. Morris, he said, Malta is on her way home. Cats have a wonderful cleverness in finding their way to their own dwelling. She will be very tired. Let us go out and meet her. Willie had gone to this place in a coach. Mr. Morris got a buggy and took Miss Laura and me with him, and we started out. We went slowly along the road. Every little while, Miss Laura blew her whistle and called, Malta, Malta, and I barked as loudly as I could. Mr. Morris drove for several hours. Then we stopped at a house, had dinner, and then set out again. We were going through a thick wood, where there was a pretty straight road when I saw a small, dark creature away ahead, trotting toward us. It was Malta. I gave a joyful bark, but she did not know me and plunged into the wood. I ran in after her, barking and yelping, and Miss Laura blew her whistle as loudly as she could. Soon, there was a little gray head peeping at us from the bushes, and Malta bounded out, gave me a look of surprise, and then leaped into the buggy on Miss Laura's lap. What a happy cat she was! She purred with delight and licked Miss Laura's gloves over and over again. 
Then she ate the food they had brought and went sound asleep. She was very thin, and for several days after getting home, she slept most of the time. Malta did not like dogs, but she was very good to cats. One day, when there was no one about and the garden was very quiet, I saw her go stealing into the stable and come out again, followed by a sore-eyed, starved-looking cat that had been deserted by some people that lived in the next street. She led this cat up to her catnip bed and watched her kindly while she rolled and rubbed herself in it. Then Malta had a roll in it herself, and they both went back to the stable. Catnip is a favorite plant with cats and Miss Laura always kept some of it growing for Malta. For a long time, this sick cat had a home in the stable. Malta carried her food every day, and after a time, Miss Laura found out about her and did what she could to make her well. In time, she got to be a strong, sturdy-looking cat, and Miss Laura got a home for her with an invalid lady. It was nothing new for the Morrises to feed deserted cats. Some summers, Mrs. Morris said she had a dozen to take care of. Careless and cruel people would go away for the summer, shutting up their houses and making no provision for the poor cat that had been allowed to sit snugly by the fire all winter. At last, Mrs. Morris got into the habit of putting a little notice in the Fairport paper asking people who were going away for the summer to provide for their cats during their absence. Chapter 13 The Beginning of an Adventure The first winter I was at the Morrises, I had an adventure. It was a week before Christmas, and we were having cold, frosty weather. Not much snow had fallen but there was plenty of skating, and the boys were off every day with their skates on a little lake near Fairport. Jim and I often went with them, and we had great fun scampering over the ice after them and slipping at every step. On this Saturday night, we had just gotten home. It was quite dark outside, and there was a cold wind blowing. So when we came in the front door and saw the red light from the big hall stove and the blazing fire in the parlor, they looked very cheerful. I was quite sorry for Jim that he had to go to his kennel. However, he didn't mind. The boys got a plate of nice warm meat for him and a bowl of milk and carried them out, and afterwards he went to sleep. Jim's kennel was a very snug one. Being a spaniel, he was not a very large dog, but his kennel was as roomy as if he was a great dane. He told me that Mr. Morris and the boys made it, and he liked it very much because it was large enough for him to get up in the night and stretch himself when he got tired of lying in one position. It was raised a little from the ground, and it had a thick layer of straw over the floor. Above was a broad shelf, wide enough for him to lie on, and covered with an old catskin sleigh robe. Jim always slept here in cold weather because it was farther away from the ground. To return to this December evening, I can remember yet how hungry I was. I could scarcely lie still till Miss Laura finished her tea. Mrs. Morris, knowing that her boys would be very hungry, had Mary broil some beef steak and roast some potatoes for them, and didn't they smell good? They ate all the steak and potatoes. It didn't matter to me, for I wouldn't have gotten any if they had been left. Mrs. Morris could not afford to give the dogs good meat that she had gotten for her children, so she used to get the butcher to send her liver and bones and tough meat, and Mary cooked them and made soup and broth and mixed porridge with them for us. We never got meat three times a day. Miss Laura said 
it was all very well to feed hunting dogs on meat but dogs that are kept about a house get ill if they are fed too well so we had meat only once a day and bread and milk porridge or dog biscuits for our other meals i made a dreadful noise when i was eating ever since jenkins cut my ears off i had had trouble breathing the flaps that kept the wind and dust from the inside of my ears now that they were gone my head was stuffed up all the time the cold weather made me worse and sometimes i had such trouble to get my breath that it seemed as if i would choke if i had opened my mouth and breathed through it as i have seen some people doing i would have been more comfortable but dogs always like to breathe through their noses you have taken more cold said miss laura this night as she put my plate of food on the floor for me finish your meat and then come sit by the fire with me what do you want more i gave a little bark so she filled my plate for the second time miss laura never allowed anyone to meddle with us when we were eating one day she found willie teasing me by snatching at a bone i was gnawing willie she said what would you do if you were just sitting down to the table feeling very hungry and just as you began to eat your meat and potatoes i would come along and snatch the plate from you i don't know what i'd do he said laughingly but i'd want to wallop you well she said i'm afraid that joe will wallop you some day if you worry him about his food for even a gentle dog will sometimes snap at anyone who disturbs him at his meals so you had better not try his patience too far willie never teased me after that and i was very glad for two or three times i had been tempted to snarl at him after i finished my tea i followed miss laura upstairs she took up a book and sat down in a low chair and i lay down on the hearth rug beside her do you know joe she said with a smile why you scratch with your paws when you lie down as if to make yourself a hollow bed and turn around a great many times before you lie down of course i did not know so i only stared at her years and years ago she went on gazing down at me there weren't any dogs living in people's houses as you are joe they were all wild creatures running about the woods they always scratched among the leaves to make a comfortable bed for themselves and the habit has come down to you joe for you are descended from them this sounded very interesting and i think she was going to tell me some more about my wild forefathers but just then the rest of the family came in i always thought that this was the snuggest time of the day when the family all sat around the fire mrs morris sewing the boys reading or studying and mr morris with his head buried in a newspaper and billy and i on the floor at their feet this evening i was feeling very drowsy and had almost dropped asleep when ned gave me a push with his foot he was a great tease and he delighted in getting me to make a simpleton of myself i tried to keep my eyes on the fire but i could not and just had to turn and look at him he was holding his book up between himself and his mother and was opening his mouth as wide as he could and throwing back his head and pretending to howl for the life of me i could not help giving a loud howl mrs morris looked up and said bad joe keep still the boys were all laughing behind their books for they knew what ned was doing presently he started off again and i was just beginning another howl that might have made mrs morris send me out of the room when the door opened and a young girl called bessie drury came in she had a cap on and a shawl thrown over her shoulders and she had just run across the street from her father's house oh miss morris she said 
Will you let Laura come over and stay with me tonight? Mama has just gotten a telegram from Bangor saying her aunt, Mrs. Cole, is very ill, and she wants to see her, and Papa is going to take her there by tonight's train, and she is afraid I will be lonely if I don't have Laura. Can you not come and spend the night here? said Miss Morris. No, thank you. I think Mama would rather have me stay in our house. Very well, said Mrs. Morris. I think Laura would like to go. Yes, indeed, said Laura, smiling at her friend. I will come over in half an hour. Thank you so much, said Miss Bessie, and she hurried away. After she left, Mr. Morris looked up from his paper. There will be someone in the house besides those two girls. Oh, yes, said Mrs. Morris. Mrs. Drury has her old nurse who has been with her for twenty years, and there are two maids besides, and Donald, the coachman, who sleeps over at the stable, so they are well protected. Very good, said Mr. Morris, and he went back to his paper. Of course, dumb animals do not understand all they hear spoken of, but I think human beings would be astonished if they knew how much we can gather from their looks and voices. I knew that Mr. Morris did not quite like the idea of having his daughter go to the Drury's when the master and mistress of the house were away, so I made up my mind that I would go with her. When she came downstairs with her little satchel on her arm, I got up and stood beside her. Dear old Joe, she said, you must not come. I pushed myself out the door beside her after she had kissed her mother and father and the boys. Go back, Joe, she said firmly. I had to step back then, but I cried and whined, and she looked at me in astonishment. I will be back in the morning, Joe, she said gently. Don't squeal in that way. Then she shut the door and went out. I felt dreadfully. I walked up and down the floor and ran to the window and howled without having to look at Ned. Mrs. Morris peered over her glasses at me in utter surprise. Boys, she said, did you ever see Joe act in that way before? No, mother, they all said. Mr. Morris was looking at me very intently. He had always taken more notice of me than any other creature about the house, and I was very fond of him. Now I ran up and put my paws on his knees. Mother, he said, turning to his wife, let the dog go. Very well, she said in a puzzled way. Jack, just run over with him and tell Mrs. Drury how he is acting, and that I will be very much obliged if she will let him stay all night with Laura. Jack sprang up, seized his cap, and raced down the front steps across the street through the gate, and up the graveled walk where the little stones were all hard and fast in the frost. The Drurys lived in a large white house with trees all around it and a garden at the back. They were rich people and had a great deal of company. Through the summer, I had often seen carriages at the door, and ladies and gentlemen in light clothes walking over the lawn, and sometimes I smelled nice things they were having to eat. They did not keep any dogs, nor pets of any kind, so Jim and I never had an excuse to call there. Jack and I were soon at the front door, and he rang the bell and gave me in charge of the maid who opened it. The girl listened to his message from Mrs. Drury. Then she walked upstairs, smiling and looking at me over her shoulder. There was a trunk in the upper hall, and an elderly woman was putting things in it. A lady stood watching her, and when she saw me, she gave a little scream. Oh, nurse, look at that horrid dog. Where did he come from? Put him out, Susan. I stood quite still and the girl who had brought me upstairs gave her Jack's message. Certainly, certainly, said the lady when the maid finished speaking. If he is one of the Morris dogs, he is sure to be a well-behaved one. Tell the little boy to thank his mamma 
for letting Laura come over and say that we will keep the dog with pleasure. Now, nurse, we must hurry. The cab will be here in five minutes. I walked softly into a front room, and there I found my dear Miss Laura. Miss Bessie was with her, and they were cramming things into a portmanteau. They both ran out to find out how I came there, and just then a gentleman came hurriedly upstairs and said the cab had come. There was a scene of great confusion and hurry, but in minutes it was all over. The cab had rolled away, and the house was quiet. Nurse, you must be tired. You had better go to bed, said Miss Bessie, turning to the elderly woman as we all stood in the hall. Susan, will you bring some supper to the dining room for Miss Morris and me? What will you have, Laura? Well, what are you going to have? asked Miss Laura with a smile. Hot chocolate and tea biscuits. Then I will have the same. Bring some cake too, Susan, said Miss Bessie. And something for the dog. I dare say he would like some of that turkey that was left from dinner. If I had had any ears, I would have pricked them up at this, for I was very fond of fowl, and I never got any at the Morrises unless it might be a stray bone or two. What fun we had over our supper! The two girls sat at the big dining table and sipped their chocolate and laughed and talked, and I had the skeleton of a whole turkey on a newspaper that Susan spread on the carpet. I was very careful not to drag it about, and Miss Bessie laughed at me till the tears came in her eyes. That dog is such a gentleman, she said. See how he holds bones on the paper with his paws and strips all the meat off with his teeth. Oh, Joe, Joe, you are a funny dog, and you are having a funny supper. I have heard of quail on toast, but I never heard of turkey on newspaper. Hadn't we better go to bed? said Miss Laura when the hall clock struck eleven. Yes, I suppose we had, said Miss Bessie. Where is this animal to sleep? I don't know, said Miss Laura. He sleeps in the stable at home or in the kennel with Jim. Suppose Susan makes him a nice bed by the kitchen stove, said Miss Bessie. Susan made the bed, but I was not willing to sleep in it. I barked so loudly when they shut me up alone that they had to let me go upstairs with them. Miss Laura was almost angry with me, but I could not help it. I had come over there to protect her, and I wasn't going to leave her if I could help it. Miss Bessie had a handsomely furnished room with a soft carpet on the floor and pretty curtains at the windows. There were two single beds in it, and the two girls dragged them close together so that they could talk after they got in bed. Before Miss Bessie put out the light, she told Miss Laura not to be alarmed if she heard anyone walking about in the night, for the nurse was sleeping across the hall from them, and she would probably come in once or twice to see if they were sleeping comfortably. The two girls talked for a long time, and then they fell asleep. Just before Miss Laura dropped off, she forgave me and put down her hand for me to lick as I lay on a fur rug close by her bed. I was very tired, and I had a very soft and pleasant bed, so I soon fell into a heavy sleep, but I waked up at the slightest noise. Once Miss Laura turned in bed, and another time Miss Bessie laughed in her sleep, and again, there were queer crackling noises in the frosty limbs of the trees outside that made me start up quickly out of my sleep. There was a big clock in the hall, and every time it struck, I waked up. Once, just after it had struck some hour, I jumped up out of a sound nap. I had been dreaming about my early home. Jenkins was after me with a whip, and my limbs were quivering and trembling as if I had been trying to get away from him. I sprang up and shook myself, 
Then I took a turn around the room. The two girls were breathing gently. I could scarcely hear them. I walked to the door and looked out into the hall. There was a dim light burning there. The door of the nurse's room stood open. I went quietly to it and looked in. She was breathing heavily and muttering in her sleep. I went back to my rug and tried to go to sleep, but I could not. Such an uneasy feeling was upon me that I had to keep walking about. I went out into the hall again and stood at the head of the staircase. I thought I would take a walk through the lower hall and then go to bed again. The Drury's carpets were all like velvet, and my paws did not make a rattling on them as they did on the oil cloth at the Morris's. I crept down the stairs like a cat and walked along the lower hall, smelling under all the doors, listening as I went. There was no night light burning down here, and it was quite dark, but if there had been any strange person about, I would have smelled him. I was surprised when I got near the farther end of the hall to see a tiny gleam of light shine for an instant from under the dining room door. Then it went away again. The dining room was the place to eat. Surely none of the people in the house would be there after the supper we had. I went and sniffed under the door. There was a smell there, a strong smell like beggars and poor people. It smelled like Jenkins. It was Jenkins. Chapter 14 How We Caught the Burglar What was the wretch doing in the house with my dear Miss Laura? I thought I would go crazy. I scratched at the door and barked and yelped. I sprang up on it, and though I was quite a heavy dog by this time, I felt as light as a feather. It seemed to me that I would go mad if I could not get that door open. Every few seconds I stopped and put my head down to the door sill to listen. There was a rushing about inside the room and a chair fell over and someone seemed to be getting out of the window. This made me worse than ever. I did not stop to think that I was only a medium-sized dog and that Jenkins would probably kill me if he got his hands on me. I was so furious that I thought only of getting hold of him. In the midst of the noise that I made, there was a screaming and a rushing to and fro upstairs. I ran up and down the hall, and halfway up the stairs and back again. I did not want Miss Laura to come down, but how was I to make her understand? There she was in her white gown, leaning over the railing and holding back her long hair, her face a picture of surprise and alarm. The dog has gone mad, screamed Miss Bessie. Nurse, pour a pitcher of water on him. The nurse was more sensible. She ran downstairs, her nightcap flying and a blanket that she had seized from her bed trailing her. There are thieves in the house, she shouted at the top of her voice, and the dog has found it out. She did not go near the dining room door, but threw open the front one, crying, Policeman, policeman, help, help, thieves, murder. Such a screaming as that old woman made. She was worse than I was. I dashed by her, out through the hall door, and away down to the gate, where I heard someone running. I gave a few loud yelps to call Jim, and leaped the gate, as the man before me had done. There was something savage in me that night. I think it must have been the smell of Jenkins. I felt as if I could tear him to pieces. I have never felt so wicked since. I was hunting him as he had hunted me and my mother, and the thought gave me pleasure. Old Jim soon caught up with me, and I gave him a push with my nose to let him know I was glad he had come. We rushed swiftly on, and at the corner, 
caught up with the miserable man who was running away from us. I gave an angry growl, and jumping up, bit at his leg. He turned around, and though it was not a very bright night, there was enough light for me to see the ugly face of my old master. He seemed so angry to think that Jim and I dared to snap at him. He caught up a handful of stones and with some bad words threw them at us. Just then, away in front of us was a queer whistle and then another one like it behind us. Jenkins made a strange noise in his throat and started to run down a side street away from the direction of the two whistles. I was afraid that he was going to get away, and though I could not hold him, I kept springing up on him, and once I tripped him up. Oh, how furious he was! He kicked me against the side of a wall and gave me two or three hard blows with a stick that he caught up and kept throwing stones at me. I would not give up though I could scarcely see him for the blood that was running over my eyes. Old Jim got so angry whenever Jenkins touched me that he ran up behind and nipped his calves to make him turn on him. Soon Jenkins came to a high wall where he stopped and with a hurried look behind began to climb over it. The wall was too high for me to jump. He was going to escape. What shall I do? I barked as loudly as I could for someone to come, and then sprang up and held him by the leg as he was getting over. I had such a grip that I went over the wall with him and left Jim on the other side. Jenkins fell on his face in the earth. Then he got up and with a look of deadly hatred on his face, pounced upon me. If help had not come, I think he would have dashed my brains against the wall as he dashed out my poor little brothers against the horse's stall. But just then there was a running sound. Two men came down the street and sprang upon the wall, just where Jim was leaping up and barking in distress. I saw at once by their uniform and the clubs in their hand that they were policemen. In one short instant, they had hold of Jenkins. He gave up then, but he stood snarling at me like an ugly dog. If it hadn't been for that cur, I'd have never been caught. Why? And he staggered back and uttered a bad word. It's me own dog. More shame to you, said one of the policemen sternly. What have you been up to at this time of night to have your own dog and a quiet minister's spaniel dog chasing you through the street? Jenkins began to swear and would not tell them anything. There was a house in the garden, and just at this minute, someone opened a window and called out, Hello there! What are you doing? We're catching a thief, sir, said one of the policemen. Leastwise, I think that's what he's been up to. Could you throw us down a bit of rope? We've no handcuffs here, and one of us has to go to the lockup, and the other to Washington Street, where there's a woman yelling blue murder. And hurry up, please, sir. The gentleman threw down a rope, and in two minutes Jenkins' wrists were tied together, and he was walked through the gate, saying bad words as fast as he could to the policeman who was leading him. Good dogs, said the other policeman to Jim and me. Then he ran up the street and we followed him. As we hurried along Washington Street and came near our house, we saw lights gleaming through the darkness and heard people running to and fro. The nurse's shrieking had alarmed the neighborhood. The Morris boys were all out in the street, only half clad and shivering with cold and the Drury's coachman, with no hat on and his hair sticking up all over his head, was running about with a lantern. The neighbors' houses were all lighted up, and a good many people were hanging out of their windows and opening their doors and calling to each other to know what all this noise meant. When the policeman appeared with Jim and me at his heels, 
quite a crowd gathered around him to hear his part of the story. Jim and I dropped on the ground, panting as hard as we could, and with little streams of water running from our tongues. We were both pretty well used up. Jim's back was bleeding in several places, from the stones that Jenkins had thrown at him, and I was a mass of bruises. Presently we were discovered, and then what a fuss was made over us. Brave dogs, noble dogs, everybody said, and patted and praised us. We were very proud and happy, and stood up and wagged our tails. At least Jim did, and I wagged what I could. Then they found what a state we were in. Mrs. Morris cried, and catching me up in her arms, ran in the house with me, and Jack followed with old Jim. We all went to the parlor. There was a good fire there, and Miss Laura and Miss Bessie were sitting over it. They sprang up when they saw us, and right there in the parlor washed our wounds and made us lie down by the fire. You saved our silver, brave Joe, said Miss Bessie. Just wait till my papa and mamma come home and see what they will say. Well, Jack, what is the latest? As the Morris boys came trooping into the room. The policeman has been questioning your nurse and examining the dining room and has gone down to the station to make his report. And do you know what he has found out? Said Jack excitedly. No, what? Asked Miss Bessie. Why, that villain was going to burn your house. Miss Bessie gave a little shriek. Why, what do you mean? Well, said Jack, they think, by what they discovered, that he planned to pack his bag with silver and carry it off. But just before he did so, he would pour oil all around the room and set fire to it so people would not find out he had been robbing you. Why, we might have all been burned to death, said Miss Bessie. He couldn't burn the dining room without setting fire to the rest of the house. Certainly not, said Jack. That shows what a villain he is. Do they know this for certain, Jack? asked Miss Laura. Well, I suppose so. They found some bottles of oil along with the bag he had for the silver. How horrible, you darling old Joe. Perhaps you saved our lives. And pretty Miss Bessie kissed my ugly, swollen head. I could do nothing but lick her little hand, but always after that, I thought a great deal of her. It is now some years since all this happened, and I might as well tell the end of it. The next day, the Drurys came home, and everything was found out about Jenkins. The night they left Fairport, he had been hanging about the station. He knew just who were left in the house, for he had once supplied them with milk, and he knew all about their family. He had no customers at this time, for after Mr. Harry rescued me, and that piece came out in the paper about him, he found that no one would take milk from him. His wife died and some kind people put his children in an asylum, and he was obliged to sell Toby and the cows. Instead of learning a lesson from all this and leading a better life, he kept sinking lower. He was, therefore, ready for any kind of mischief that turned up, and when he saw the Drurys going away in the train, he thought he would steal a bag of silver from their sideboard, then set fire to the house, and run away and hide the silver. After a time, he would take it to some city and sell it. He was made to confess all this. Then for his wickedness, he was sent to prison for ten years, and I hope he will get to be a better man there, and be one after he comes out. I was sore and stiff for a long time, and one day Miss Drury came over to see me. She did not love dogs as the Morrises did. She tried to, but she could not. Dogs can see the fun in things as well as people can, and I buried my muzzle in the hearth rug so she would not see how I was curling up my lip and smiling at her. You are a good dog, she said slowly. 
you are then she stopped and could not think of anything else to say to me i got up and stood in front of her for a well-bred dog should not lie down when a lady speaks to him i wagged my body a little and i would gladly have said something to help her out of her difficulty but i couldn't if she had stroked me it might have helped her but she didn't want to touch me and i knew she didn't want me to touch her so i just stood looking at her mrs morris she said turning from me with a puzzled face i don't like animals and i can't pretend to for they always find me out but can't you let that dog know that i shall feel eternally grateful to him for saving not only our property for that is a trifle but my darling daughter from fright and annoyance and possible injury or loss of life i think he understands said mrs morris he is a very wise dog and smiling in great amusement she called me to her and put my paws on her lap look at that lady joe she is pleased with you for driving jenkins away from her house you remember jenkins i barked angrily and limped to the window how intelligent he is said mrs drury my husband has sent to new york for a watchdog and he says that from this on our house shall never be without one now i must go your dog is happy mrs morris and i can do nothing for him except to say that i shall never forget him and i wish he would come over occasionally to see us perhaps when we get our dog he will i shall tell my cook whenever she sees him to give him something to eat this is a souvenir for laura of that dreadful night i feel under a deep obligation to you so i am sure you will allow her to accept it then she gave mrs morris a little box and went away when miss laura came in she opened the box and found in it a handsome diamond ring on the inside of it was engraved laura in memory of december twentieth eighteen blank from her grateful friend bessie the diamond was worth hundreds of dollars and mrs morris told miss laura that she had rather she would not wear it then while she was a young girl it was not suitable for her and she knew miss drury did not expect her to do so she wished to give her a valuable present and this would always be worth a great deal of money Chapter 15 Our Journey to Riverdale Every other summer, the Morris children were sent to some place in the country so that they could have a change of air and see what country life was like. As there were so many of them, they usually went different ways. The summer after I came to them, Jack and Carl went to an uncle in Vermont miss laura went to another in new hampshire and ned and willie went to visit a maiden aunt who lived in the white mountains mr and mrs morris stayed at home fairport was a lovely place in the summer and many people came there to visit the children took some of their pets with them and the others they left at home for their mother to take care of she never allowed them to take a pet anywhere unless she knew it would be perfectly welcome. Don't let your pets be a worry to other people, she often said to them, or they will dislike them and you too. Miss Laura went away earlier than the others, for she had run down through the spring and was pale and thin. One day, early in June, we set out i say we for after my adventure with jenkins miss laura said that i should never be parted from her if any one invited her to come and see them and didn't want me she would stay at home the whole family went to the station to see us off they put a chain on my collar and took me to the baggage office and got two tickets for me one was tied to my collar 
and the other Miss Laura put in her purse. Then I was put in a baggage car and chained in a corner. I heard Mr. Morris say that as we were only going a short distance, it was not worth while to get an express ticket for me. There was a dreadful noise and bustle at the station. Whistles were blowing and people were rushing up and down the platform. Some men were tumbling baggage so fast into the car where I was that I was afraid some of it would fall on me. For a few minutes, Miss Laura stood by the door and looked in, but soon the men had piled up so many boxes and trunks that she could not see me. Then she went away. Mr. Morris asked one of the men to see that I did not get hurt, and I heard some money rattle. Then he went away, too. It was the beginning of June, and the weather had suddenly become very hot. We had a long, cold spring, and not being used to the heat, it seemed very hard to bear. Before the train started, the doors of the baggage car were closed, and it became quite dark inside. The darkness and the heat and the close smell and the noise as we went rushing along made me feel sick and frightened. I did not dare to lie down, but sat up trembling and wishing that we might soon come to Riverdale Station. But we did not get there for some time, and I was to have a great fright. I was thinking of all the stories that I knew of animals traveling. In February, the Drury's Newfoundland watchdog, Pluto, had arrived from New York, and he told Jim and me that he had a miserable journey. A gentleman friend of Mr. Drury's had brought him from New York. He saw him chained up in his car, and he went into his pullman first tipping the baggage master handsomely to look after him. Pluto said that the baggage master had a very red nose, and he was always getting drinks for himself when they stopped at the station, but he never once gave him a drink or anything to eat from the time they left New York till they got to Fairport. When the train stopped there and Pluto's chain was unfastened, he sprang on the platform and nearly knocked Mr. Drury down. He saw some snow that had sifted through the station roof, and he was so thirsty he began to lick it up. When the snow was all gone, he jumped up and licked the frost on the windows. Mr. Drury's friend was so angry, he found the baggage master and said to him, what did you mean by coming into my car every few hours to tell me the dog was dead and wadded and comfortable? I shall report you. He went into the office at the station and complained of the man and told that he was a drinking man and was going to be dismissed. I was not afraid of suffering like Pluto because it was only going to take us a few hours to get to Riverdale. I found that we always went slowly before we came into a station, and one time, when we began to slacken speed, I thought that surely we must be at our journey's end. However, it was not Riverdale. The car gave a kind of jump. Then there was a crashing sound ahead, and we stopped. I heard men shouting and running up and down, and I wondered what had happened. It was all dark and still in the car, and nobody came in, but the noise kept up outside, and I knew something had gone wrong with the train. Perhaps Miss Laura had got hurt. Something must have happened, or she would come to me. I barked and pulled at the chain till my neck was sore, but for a long, long time I was there alone. The men running about outside must have heard me. If I ever hear a man in trouble and crying for help, I go to him and see what he wants. After such a long time that it seemed to me it must be the middle of the night, the door at the end of the car opened and a man looked in. This is all baggage for New York, miss, I heard him say. They wouldn't put your dog in here. 
Yes, they did. I am sure this is the car. I heard the voice I knew so well. And won't you get him out, please? He must be terribly frightened. The man stooped down and unfastened my chain, grumbling to himself because I had not been put in another car. Some folks tumble a dog round as if he was a junk of coal, he said, patting me kindly. I was nearly wild with delight to get with Miss Laura again, but I had barked so much and pressed my neck so hard with my collar that my voice was all gone. I fawned on her and wagged myself about and opened and shut my mouth, but no sound came out of it. It made Miss Laura nervous. She tried to laugh and cry at the same time and then bit her lip hard and said, Oh, Joe, don't. He's lost his bark, hasn't he? said the man, looking at me curiously. It's a wicked thing to confine an animal in a dark and closed car, said Miss Laura, trying to see her way down the steps through her tears. The man put out his hand and helped her. He's not suffered much, miss, he said. Don't distress yourself. Now, if you'd been a brakeman on a Chicago train, as I was a few years ago, and seen the animals run in for the stockyards, you might talk about cruelty. Cars that ought to hold a certain number of pigs or sheep or cattle, jammed full with twice as many, and half of them thrown out, choked, and smothered to death. I've seen a man running up and down, raging and swearing because the railway people hadn't let him get in to tend to his pigs on the road. Miss Laura turned and looked at the man with a very white face. Is it like that now? she asked. Uh, no, no, he said hastily. It's better now. They've got new regulations about taking care of the stock. But mind you, miss, the cruelty to animals isn't all done on the railways. There's a great lot of dumb creatures suffering all round everywhere. And if they could speak, "'Twould be a hard showing for some other people besides the railway men. He lifted his cap and hurried down the platform, and Miss Laura, her face very much troubled, picked her way among the bits of coal and wood scattered about the platform and went into the waiting room of the little station. She took me up to the filter and let some water run in her hand and gave it to me to lap. Then she sat down, and I leaned my head against her knees, and she stroked my throat gently. There were some people sitting about the room, and from their talk I found out what had taken place. There had been a freight train on a side track at this station waiting for us to get by. The switchman had carelessly left the switch open after this train went by, and when we came along afterward, our train, instead of running in by the platform, went crashing into the freight train. If we had been going fast, great damage might have been done. As it was, our engine was smashed so badly that it could not take us on. The passengers were frightened, and we were having a tedious time waiting for another engine to come and take us to Riverdale. After the accident, the train men were so busy that Miss Laura could get no one to release me. When I sat by her, I noticed an old gentleman staring at us. He was such a queer-looking old gentleman. He looked like a poodle. He had bright brown eyes and a pointed face and a shock of white hair that he shook every few minutes. He sat with his hands clasped on top of his cane and he scarcely took his eyes from Miss Laura's face. Suddenly, he jumped up and came and sat down beside her. An ugly dog, that, he said, pointing to me. Most young ladies would have resented this, but Miss Laura only looked amused. He seems beautiful to me, she said gently. <laughs> because he's your dog said the old man, darting a sharp look at me. What's the matter with him? This is his first journey by rail, and he's a little frightened. No wonder. The Lord only knows the suffering of animals in transportation, said the old gentleman. 
my dear young lady if you could see what i've seen you'd never eat another bit of meat all the days of your life miss laura wrinkled her forehead i know i have heard she faltered it must be terrible terrible it's awful said the gentleman think of the cattle on the western plains choked with dust in the summer and starved and frozen in the winter dehorned and goaded onto trains and steamers tossed about and wounded and suffering on voyages many of em dying and being thrown into the sea others landed sick and frightened some of them slaughtered on docks and wharves to keep them from dropping dead in their tracks what kind of food does their flesh make it's rank poison three of my family have died of cancer i'm a vegetarian the strange old gentleman darted from his seat and began to pace up and down the room i was very glad he had gone for miss laura hated to hear of cruelty of any kind and her tears were dropping thick and fast on my brown coat the gentleman had spoken very loudly and every one in the room had listened to what he said among them was a very young man with a cold handsome face he looked as if he was annoyed that the older man should have made miss laura cry don't you think so he said as the old gentleman passed near him in walking up and down the floor that there is a great deal of mock sentiment about this business of taking care of the dumb creation they were made for us they've got to suffer and be killed to supply our wants the cattle and sheep and other animals would overrun the earth if we didn't kill them granted said the old man stopping right in front of him granted young man if you take out that word suffer the lord made the sheep and the cattle and the pigs they are his creatures just as much as we are we can kill em but we've no right to make em suffer but we can't help it sir yes yes we can my young man it's a possible thing to raise help the stock treat it kindly kill it mercifully eat it decently when men do that i for one will cease to be a vegetarian you're only a boy you haven't traveled as i have i've been from one end of this country to the other up north down south and out west i've seen sights that made me shudder and i tell you the lord will punish this great american nation if it doesn't change its treatment of the dumb animals committed to its care the young man looked thoughtful and did not reply a very sweet-faced old lady sitting near him answered the old gentleman i don't think i have ever seen such a fine-looking old lady as she was her hair was snowy white and her face was deeply wrinkled yet she was tall and stately and her expression was as pleasing as my dear miss laura's i do not think we are a wicked nation she said softly we are a younger nation than many of the nations of the earth and i think many of our sins arise from ignorance and thoughtlessness yes madame yes madame said the fiery old gentleman staring hard at her i agree with you there she smiled very pleasantly at him and went on i too have been a traveler and i have talked to many great wise and good people on the subject of the cruel treatment of animals and i find that many of them have never thought about it they themselves never knowingly ill-treat a dumb creature and when they are told stories of inhumane conduct they say in surprise why these things surely can't exist you see they have never been brought in contact with them as soon as they learn about them they begin to agitate and say we must have this thing stopped where is the remedy what is it madame in your opinion said the old gentleman pawing the floor with impatience just the remedy that i would propose for the great evil of intemperance said the old lady smiling at him legislation and education legislation for the old and hardened and education for the young and tender i would tell the schoolboys and schoolgirls that alcohol will destroy the framework of their beautiful bodies and that cruelty to any of god's living creatures will blight and destroy their innocent young souls the young man spoke out again don't you think 
he said, that your temperance and humane people lay too much stress upon the education of our youth in all lofty and noble sentiments? The human heart will always be wicked. Your Bible tells you that, doesn't it? You can't educate all the badness out of children. We don't expect to do that, said the old lady, turning her pleasant face toward him. But even if the human heart is desperately wicked, shouldn't that make us much more eager to try to educate, to ennoble, to restrain? However, as far as my experience goes, and I have lived in this wicked world for seventy-five years, I find that the human heart, though wicked and cruel as you say, has yet some soft and tender spots, and the impressions made upon it in youth are never, never effaced. Do you not remember better than anything else, standing at your mother's knee, the pressure of her hand, her kiss on your forehead? By this time, our engine had arrived. A whistle was blowing, and nearly every one was rushing from the room, and the impatient old gentleman among the first. Miss Laura was hurriedly trying to do up her shawl strap, and I was standing by wishing that I could help her. The old lady and the young man were the only other people in the room, and we could not help hearing what they said. Yes, I do, he said in a thick voice. His face got very red. She is dead now. I have no mother. Poor boy, and the old lady laid her hand on his shoulder. They were standing up, and she was taller than he was. May God bless you. I know you have a kind heart. I have four stalwart boys, and you remind me of the youngest. If you are ever in Washington, come to see me. She gave him some name, and he lifted his hat and looked as if he was astonished to find out who she was. Then he, too, went away, and she turned to Miss Laura. Shall I help you, my dear? If you please, said my young mistress, I can't fasten this strap. In a few seconds, the bundle was done up, and we were joyfully hastening to the train. It was only a few miles to Riverdale, so the conductor let me stay in the car with Miss Laura. She spread her coat out on the seat in front of her, and I sat on it and looked out of the car window as we sped along through a lovely country, all green and fresh in the June sunlight. How light and pleasant this car was! so different from the baggage car. What frightens an animal most of all things is not to see where it is going, not to know what is going to happen to it. I think that they are very like human beings in this respect. The lady had taken a seat beside Miss Laura, and as we went along, she too looked out of the window and said in a low voice, what is so rare as a day in June, then if ever come perfect days? That is very true, said Miss Laura. How sad that the autumn must come, and the cold winter. No, my dear, not sad. It is but a preparation for another summer. Yes, I suppose it is, said Miss Laura. Then she continued a little shyly, as her companion leaned over to stroke my cropped ears. You seem very fond of animals. I am, my dear. I have four horses, two cows, a tame squirrel, three dogs, and a cat. You should be a very happy woman, said Miss Laura with a smile. I think I am. I must not forget my horned toad, Diego, that I got in California. I keep him in the greenhouse, and he is very happy catching flies and holding his horny head to be scratched whenever one comes near. I don't see how anyone can be unkind to animals, said Miss Laura thoughtfully. Nor I, my dear child. It has always caused me intense pain to witness the torture of dumb animals. Nearly seventy years ago, when I was a little girl walking the streets of Boston, I would tremble and grow faint at the cruelty of drivers to overloaded horses. I was timid and did not dare to speak to them. Very often I ran home and flung myself in my mother's arms with a burst of tears and asked her if nothing could be done to help the poor animals. With mistaken, motherly kindness, she tried to put the subject out of my thoughts. 
I was carefully guarded from seeing or hearing of any instances of cruelty. But the animals went on suffering just the same, and when I became a woman, I saw my cowardice. I agitated the matter among my friends and told them that our whole dumb creation was groaning together in pain and would continue to groan unless merciful human beings were willing to help them. I was able to assist in the formation of several societies for the prevention of cruelty to animals, and they have done good service. Good service, not only to the horses and cows, but to the nobler man. I believe that in saying to a cruel man, you shall not overwork, torture, mutilate, nor kill your animal, or neglect to provide it with proper food and shelter, we are making him a little nearer the kingdom of heaven than he was before. For whatsoever a man soweth, he shall also reap. If he sows seeds of unkindness and cruelty to man and beast, no one knows what the blackness of the harvest will be. His poor horse, quivering under his blow, is not the worst sufferer. Oh, if people would only understand that their unkind deeds will recoil upon their own heads with tenfold force. But, my dear child, I am fancying that I am addressing a drawing-room meeting. And here we are at your station. Goodbye. Keep your happy face and gentle ways. I hope that we may meet again some day. She pressed Miss Laura's hand, gave me a farewell pat. And the next minute, we were outside on the platform, and she was smiling through the window at us. Chapter 16 Dingley Farm My dear niece! And a stout, middle-aged woman with a red, lively face threw both her arms around Miss Laura. How glad I am to see you, and this is the dog! Good Joe, I have a bone waiting for you. Here is Uncle John. A tall, good-looking man stepped up and put out a big hand, in which my mistress's little fingers were quite swallowed up. I'm glad to see you, Laura. Well, Joe, how do you do, old boy? I've heard about you. It made me feel very welcome to have them both notice me, and I was so glad to be out of the train that I frisked for joy around their feet as we went to the wagon. It was a big double one, with an awning over it to shelter it from the sun's rays, and the horses were drawn up in the shade of a spreading tree. They were two powerful black horses, and as they had no blinders on, they could see us coming. Their faces lighted up, and they moved their ears and pawed the ground and whinnied when Mr. Wood went up to them. They tried to rub their heads against him, and I saw plainly that they loved him. Steady there, Cleve and Pacer, he said. Now back up, back up. By this time, Mrs. Wood, Miss Laura, and I were in the wagon. Then Mr. Wood jumped in, took up the reins, and off we went. How the two black horses did spin along! I sat on the seat beside Mr. Wood and sniffed in the delicious air and the lovely smell of flowers and grass. How glad I was to be in the country! What long races I should have in the green fields! I wished that I had another dog to run with me and wondered very much whether Mr. Wood kept one. I knew I should soon find out, for whenever Miss Laura went to a place, she wanted to know what animals there were about. We drove a little more than a mile along a country road where there were scattered houses. Miss Laura answered questions about her family and asked questions about Mr. Harry, who was away at college and hadn't got home. I don't think I've said before that Mr. Harry was Mrs. Wood's son. She was a widow with one son when she married Mr. Wood, so that Mr. Harry, though the Morrises called him cousin, was not really their cousin. I was very glad to hear them say that he was soon coming home, for I had never forgotten that, but for him, I should never have known Miss Laura and gotten into my pleasant home. 
by and by i heard miss laura say uncle john have you a dog yes laura he said i have one today but shan't have one tomorrow oh uncle what do you mean she asked well laura he replied you know animals are pretty much like people there are some good ones and some bad ones now this dog is a snarling cross-grained cantankerous beast and when i heard that joe was coming i said now we'll have a good dog about the place and here's an end to the bad one so i tied bruno up and tomorrow i shall shoot him something's got to be done or he'll be biting someone uncle said miss laura people don't always die when they are bitten by dogs do they no certainly not replied mr wood in my humble opinion there's a great lot of nonsense talked about the poison of a dog's bite and people dying of hydrophobia ever since i was born i've had dogs snap at me and stick their teeth in my flesh and i've never had a symptom of hydrophobia and i never intend to have I believe half the people that are bitten by dogs frighten themselves into thinking they are fatally poisoned. I was reading the other day about the policemen in the big city in England that have to catch stray dogs, and dogs supposed to be mad, and all kinds of dogs, and they get bitten over and over again and never think anything about it. But let a lady or a gentleman walking along the street have a dog bite them, and they worry themselves till their blood is in a fever and they have to hurry across to france to get pasture to cure them they imagine they've got hydrophobia and they've got it because they imagine it i believe if i fixed my attention on that right thumb of mine and thought i had a sore there and picked at it and worried it in a short time a sore would come and i'd be off to the doctor to have it cured at the same time dogs have no business to bite and i don't recommend anyone to get bitten but uncle said miss laura isn't there a such thing as hydrophobia oh yes i dare say there is i believe that a careful examination of the records of death reports in boston from hydrophobia for the space of thirty-two years shows that two people actually died from it dogs are like all other animals they're liable to sickness and they've got to be watched I think my horses would go mad if I starved them, or overfed them, or overworked them, or let them stand in laziness, or kept them dirty, or didn't give them water enough. They'd get some disease, anyway. If a person owns an animal, let him take care of it, and it's all right. If it shows signs of sickness, shut it up and watch it. If the sickness is incurable, kill it. Here's a sure way to prevent hydrophobia kill off all ownerless and vicious dogs if you can't do that have plenty of water where they can get it a dog that has all the water he wants will never go mad this dog of mine has not one single thing the matter with him but pure ugliness yet if i let him loose and he ran through the village with his tongue out i'll warrant you there'd be a cry of mad dog however i'm going to kill him i've no use for a bad dog have plenty of animals i say and treat them kindly but if there's a vicious one among them put it out of the way for it is a constant danger to man and beast it's queer how ugly some people are about their dogs they'll keep them no matter how they worry other people and even when they're snatching the bread out of their neighbor's mouths but i say that it is not the fault of the four-legged dog a human dog is the worst of all. There's a band of sheep-killing dogs here in Riverdale that their owners can't, or won't, keep out of mischief. Meek-looking fellows, some of them are. The owners go to bed at night, and the dogs pretend to go too, but when the house is quiet and the family asleep, off goes Rover or Fido to worry poor defenseless creatures that can't defend themselves. Their taste for sheep's blood is like the taste for liquor in men, and the dogs will travel as far to get their fun as the men will travel for theirs. They've got it in them, and you can't get it out. Mr. Wyndham cured his dog, said Mrs. Wood. Mr. Wood burst into a hearty laugh. So he did, so he did. I must tell Laura about that. 
Wyndham is a neighbor of ours, and last summer I kept telling him that his collie was worrying my Shropshires. He wouldn't believe me, but I knew I was right, and one night when Harry was home, he lay in wait for the dog and lassoed him. I tied him up and sent for Wyndham. You should have seen his face, and the dog's face. He said two words, you scoundrel, and the dog cowered at his feet as if he had been shot. He was one fine dog, but he got corrupted by evil companions. Then Wyndham asked me where my sheep were. I told him in the pasture. He asked me if I still had my old ram, Bolton. I said yes, and then he wanted eight or ten feet of rope. I gave it to him and wondered what on earth he was going to do with it. He tied one end of it to the dog's collar, and holding the other in his hand, set out for the pasture. He asked us to go with him, and when he got there, he told Harry he'd like to see him catch Bolton. There wasn't any need to catch him. He'd come to us like a dog. Harry whistled, and when Bolton came up, Wyndham fastened the rope's end to his horns and let him go. The ram was frightened and ran, dragging the dog with him. We let them out of the pasture into an open field, and for a few minutes, there was such a racing and chasing over that field as I never saw before. Harry leaned up against the bars and laughed till the tears rolled down his cheeks. Then Bolton got mad and began to make battle with the dog, pitching into him with his horns. We soon stopped that, for the spirit had all gone out of Dash. Wyndham unfastened the rope and told him to get home, and if I ever saw a dog run, that one did. Mrs. Wyndham set great store by him, and her husband didn't want to kill him. But he said Dash had got to give up his sheep killing if he wanted to live. That cured him. He's never worried a sheep from that day to this, and if you offer him a bit of sheep's wool now, he tucks his tail between his legs and runs for home. Now I must stop my talk, for we're in sight of the farm. Yonder's our boundary line, and there's the house. You'll see a difference in the trees since you were here before. We had come to a turn in the road where the ground sloped gently upward. We turned in at the gate and drove between rows of trees up to a long, low red house with a veranda all around it. There was a wide lawn in front and away on our right were the farm buildings. They, too, were painted red, and there were some trees by them that Mr. Wood called his windbreak, because they kept the snow from drifting in the winter time. I thought it was a beautiful place. Miss Laura had been here before, but not for some years, so she, too, was looking about quite eagerly. Welcome to Dingley Farm, Joe, said Miss Wood with her jolly laugh as she watched me jump from the carriage seat to the ground. Come on in and I'll introduce you to Pussy. Aunt Hattie, why is the farm called Dingley Farm, said Miss Laura as we went into the house. It ought to be Wood Farm. Dingley is made out of dingle, Laura. You know that pretty hollow back of the pasture? It's what they call a dingle. So this farm was called Dingle Farm, till the people around about got saying Dingley instead. I suppose they found it easier. Why, here is Lolo coming to see Joe. Walking along the wide hall that ran through the house was a large tortoise shell cat. She had a prettily marked face, and she was waving her tail like a flag and mewing kindly to greet her mistress. But when she saw me, what a face she made. She flew on the hall table and putting up her back till it almost lifted her feet from the ground, began to spit at me and bristle with rage. Poor Lolo, said Mrs. Wood going up to her. Joe is a good dog and not like Bruno. He won't hurt you. I wagged myself about a little and looked kindly at her, but she did nothing but say bad words to me. It was weeks and weeks before I made friends with that cat. She was a young thing, 
and had only known one dog, and he was a bad one, so she supposed all dogs were like him. There was a number of rooms opening off the hall, and one of them was a dining room where they had tea. I lay on a rug outside the door and watched them. There was a small table spread with a white cloth, and it had pretty dishes and glassware on it, and a good many different kinds of things to eat. A little French girl called Adele kept coming and going from the kitchen to give them hot cakes and fried eggs and hot coffee. As soon as they finished their tea, Mrs. Wood gave me one of the best meals that I have ever had in my life. 